Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Dawn or Doom, day two. I'm pleased to introduce Jocelyn Dunn. Ms. Dunn is currently a PhD candidate in the School of, on Inter of Industrial Engineering at Purdue University. Her doctoral research is focused on creating technologies for data-driven health monitoring and stress management. Using wearable devices that continuously, mon continuously collect data about sleep, diet, and exercise, Ms. Dunn is developing data an analytics for dynamically identifying health and stress states. Recently, Dunn has researched the health and stress levels of a simulator astronaut crew as chief scientist for Hawaii Space Exploration Analog and Simulation. This eight-month mission simulated her enduring academic interest in the health challenges that astronauts face in the extreme environment of space. In 2009, Dunn received a bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering from Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. In 2011, Dunn completed the master's degree in biomedical engineering from Purdue University with thesis on patented biological scaffold for vascularized tissue repair and replacement. Today, she'll be presenting a talk titled Health and Stress Monitoring Throughout a Long Duration. Please silence your electronic devices, but don't put them away. We want to see you tweeting the hashtag Dawn or Doom. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Dunn. Good morning. Thank you all for attending this talk. I'm going to speak about the dawn or doom of space exploration, and more specifically, the dawn or doom of Mars exploration. Behind me, you see photos from simulated Mars in Hawaii, where I was with five others for eight months, living in this 1,000-square-foot dome. So you can see the day and night of our terrain there on Mauna Loa. And I think the day or night is also part of our dawn or doom theme. Uh, when you think about night, it, there's this inherent kind of fear that human beings have of, of the night, of being in the dark. Uh, but for some of us, when we look at the night sky, it's the dawn feeling as well, the dawn of exploring and figuring out what, our, what is our place in this universe what, among the hundreds of billions of galaxies out there. Do you feel this dawn or doom feeling when you look up at the night sky? And I've always loved looking at the night sky, so it was difficult for me as part of the simulated Mars mission, we could only go outside wearing spacesuits. And with that, you have a helmet with a visor that just has glare and reflection, so you can't see the night sky as clearly. So I'll never um, lose my appreciation for the night sky again to be able to see it as clearly as we can now and not have to rely on our cameras to capture images and be able to see the terrain uh, that way. So yeah, you can check out my blog. I was writing throughout the mission uh, about my experiences and our crew's um, progress during the mission, and I'll still continue blogging as I analyze our data from this mission. So I know a lot of you probably have a bleeding heart like me for space exploration, so I'll get the bad news out of the way and just go for the doom first. Uh, so one risk is definitely loss of life in human space exploration. We've had disasters in the past, Apollo 1, Challenger, Columbia. So NASA's primary job is really mis risk management to mitigate the risks that astronauts face uh, in this extremely technical and complex challenge of exploring and, and make, going at the edge of new frontiers. The other thing we have to worry about is planetary protection. If we go to other worlds and we do find life, we don't want to disturb their ecosystems. And we also don't want to bring anything back that can disturb life and plague our own humanity. So there's international treaties that have been developed in the 50s that uh, globally all space agencies have to follow these rules and regulations about sample collection and about uh, the way that we conduct these missions so that we don't disturb other planets or our own on the way back. So now the good side, the dawn. So we're at a dawn of space exploration, especially if you think about the commercialization of space. Uh, we have SpaceX taking cargo up to the space station, and soon we'll also be taking astronauts as well. And there's a long list of people who are interested in paying for this, so no longer is it going to have to be government-funded national programs. will be a, an emerging market that's going to fully develop soon for the commercialization of space. Also, uh, the journey to Mars is having, has all these spin-offs that will become economic, valuable uh, businesses that will be based on the technology we develop to be able to live sustainably in the Mars environment. We have to re reuse and repurpose all of our resources, and that can help us to live more sustainably on Earth as well. 
I also have to study teamwork, how to work together and stay happy and cooperative for three years that is currently planned for a Mars mission. The other aspect is when you think about health and disease, this uh, atmosphere or the environment of space is a very cruel environment and you have this accelerated aging process and disease development that can uh, happen as a result of space exploration. So there's tangible and intangible value to why we want to explore space. And these values guide the NASA program's direction and uh, their mission plans. So what I want to start out first with is talking about NASA's pathway to Mars, then uh, dial down to the crew selection and training, and where high seas the simulated mission that I was a part of, fits into this, and some of my research as well. And then I'll de definitely leave a lot of time for questions at the end, too. So here's some background that uh, we need to know to understand the challenge of going to Mars. Uh, you can see here in this green orbit, this is low Earth orbit, and that's where the space station is. I think Neil deGrasse Tyson said it best, uh, that when you look at a typical school globe in a classroom, that it's just a fingernail away is the space station. It's so close to Earth in this low Earth orbit. And we've gone to the moon before. This is called the cis lunar space, the space in between Earth and the moon. And uh, that's about uh, almost like 400,000 kilometers. But the journey to Mars is four, over 400 million kilometers. So it's many order to, orders of magnitude more difficult uh, to be able to send uh, both the propulsion to get us there and the human challenge of keeping astronauts healthy for the long duration. So the uh, way that we can get there is not going to be just one giant leap. We have to develop these technologies sequentially and do more and more difficult and advanced missions that can help us develop these technologies along the way. So this is the pathway, Pathways report from a committee on human space exploration. Our president, Mitch Daniels, co-chaired this committee. And what they found is that this will definitely require international and commercial partnerships, as well as increases in the NASA budget. It, currently, it just increases with inflation. And they, they uh, said it should be plus 2 to 3% per year as well. And the idea is that we're going to move from being Earth reliant to go on to uh, more intermediate goals to go to an asteroid, for example, as currently planned. These will go, go from just uh, hourly or daily scale missions to destinations that can take months to reach, and then eventually to be Earth independent and to be able to sustain uh, your crew for the long duration of a Mars mission. So here's uh, the 12 missions as currently planned. We have the space station that will be, like currently Scott Kelly is there for a year along with a Russian cosmonaut to study the health effects of being in microgravity for the long duration. And then these are the intermediate proving ground missions that are currently planned to visit asteroids. So those have near-Earth asteroids. They have implications for the security and survival of our species because these asteroids, they've identified so many that are large enough to really have a huge impact on, on, on life, just like the dinosaurs you know, had asteroid impacts that ended their existence. So we need to learn how to deflect asteroids, change their paths, and protect, protect our planet. And then along the way, we'll be developing the propulsion we need and the human uh, life support that we need to eventually uh, go towards the goal of becoming Earth independent and having a trip all the way to Mars and back. So I encourage you all to support NASA's budget increases. Uh, this is the current planned uh, trajectory, but it's into the 2030s, we could speed it up a lot if we had more funding. Uh, so these are, oh, excuse me, uh, these are the uh, Indiana congressmen that you can tweet away at and some of the useful hashtags, Journey to Mars, Fund NASA, Penny for NASA. The idea is that currently we have half a penny on the dollar uh, or 0.5% of the federal budget goes to NASA. So um, I used to go to Washington, D.C. and advocate for just give us a penny on the dollar. 1%. So this is, you can see, the NASA budget over time and the Apollo days over 5%. And here we are now uh, quite low. So let's support NASA uh, in that way as well. So here's the capability-driven framework that NASA has, uh, has moved over from mission-driven technology development to capability-driven uh, so that no matter the political climate or the goals, how our 
our values and destinations change, that we still will develop all the capabilities along the way that we need independent of the mission site selection process. So here's, uh, we have to go from a new propulsion to reach beyond that low Earth orbit, and then we'll be able to keep going along this pathway and developing uh, technologies in these 12 areas are the key areas for capability development, and they've put together these teams uh, to look at different areas, such as the, uh, the area that I'm most interested in, the crew health and protection. But there's all types of technologies that are needed, gaps that they need to fill in order to uh, make this a, a possibility of going to Mars and back. And it wouldn't be NASA if they didn't also look at the risks. So here is a table, I don't expect you to see it all, but over 30 risks just in that health and protection category that have been identified as areas that need to be mitigated. And the key is microgravity. Being without gravity, you have bone and muscle deterioration that happens. So this is similar to the aging process of osteoporosis in some ways. And then the radiation exposure can lead to DNA damage that uh, can cause cancer. Uh, so this is another important area is protecting astronauts from radiation, both from the sun and space radiation. And then just the distance from Earth. If you have a medical issue that arises, there's no hospital on the way to Mars. You have to carry everything with you, and you might not know what you ex exactly you will need. And also, uh, prescriptions, they expire. And this is a three-year mission, and same with the food. Uh, you have to have shelf-stable foods and medicines that you can take with you on this long journey. And then the isolation and confinement of, law, of it all, that's where high seas fits in putting us in this isolated, confined environment and seeing what are our behavioral conditions over time. So let's move on to talk about crew selection and training. Even with all these risks, there's still plenty of people who don't even think about it and want to be an astronaut. And if you're in that camp, here's some of the basic requirements you need. Um, I love that this was the, the 2011 call for applications. And here you can see frequent travel may be required. <laughs> Yeah, to space, <laughs> so how great is that? Uh, but they also have to travel a lot for their training. Uh, so these are kind of the basic requirements. You need to study sciences, uh, physical or life sciences, engineering or math, and then uh, have at least three years of related experience or education can count for that, a master's, PhD. And, uh, or you can instead have flight training. Have good vision, good blood pressure, be the right height. And then uh, there's still no guarantee if you make it past these requirements and the interview processes, then the next is the astronaut candidate program, which is a several year program where they do lots of training, uh, some in the water, because uh, with the, the simulation, it's the best simulation that we have for going out on EVAs to put them in a neutrally buoyant uh, pool uh, and underwater with the full mock-up of the space station and they can practice underwater and learn how to uh, support the space station systems. They also have flight training and robotics training. And then after that, uh, they become full astronauts and can be chosen for missions. So for um, the other aspects of long duration flight though, we're not just looking for the best individuals anymore. We're trying to find the best team. It's not just the couple months at the space station anymore. They have to they have to pick candidates who are going to work well and, and cooperate as a team. So here's some of the behavioral and performance risks that they're trying to avoid uh, to look for people who are going to be resilient uh, among all the challenges. Being away from your family and friends for such a long time can definitely be stressful. And they want to pick teams that don't have any natural fault lines among the group. So you don't want them to be half military and half civilian where all the military are engineers and all the civilians are scientists. You want it to kind of mix. You have uh, no, none of these natural fault lines within the group when you're looking at crew selection. And then, of course, to uh, be able to handle all of the, the, the fatigue and sleep loss that occurs in space and to be able to control your health and stress, which is where my research comes in, to be able to understand our health and stress in an automated manner uh, and be able to intervene and help the crew with uh, coordinating their workloads and uh, avoiding some of these what we call adverse behavioral conditions. So for our crew, uh, we had a similar selection process where you apply online to start 
And then we went to this uh, backpacking training called the National Outdoor Leadership School in Wyoming. So there you can see uh, the girls, and here we are on the summit of Mount Geike. And this was part of our selection process. We uh, had a group of 10 finalists, and then they had to whittle it down to the best six-person team of the group. And we actually met uh, other astronauts along the way. They're, they were on this similar Knowles course, a little bit longer than ours, uh, practicing their teamwork and outdoor skills as well. So um, that was a great treat for us to meet some of the real astronauts and be able to talk to them about uh, their job. And then we went on to Hawaii where we did geology training. This is the six-person crew. And we did habitat systems training as well before we entered the habitat. So we had really only, only known each other for you know, about a month or so before we entered the HAB for an eight-month-long mission. So now I'll go on and talk about our mission a bit more. Here's HiSEAS. It's the Hawaii Space Exploration Analog and Simulation. It's the brainchild of Kim Binstead at the University of Hawaii. She has NASA grants to fund this project. There's a series of missions that are looking at our psychological, biological, and social adaptations to this extreme environment of confinement and isolation. It was very crowded in the dome, but also on the list of research projects that we were conducting there. So um, here is Michigan State. They did sociometer badges I'll show later to measure our social interactions and quantify those. Uh, John Topkins, they uh, have a computer game that is able to tell them how cooperative and competitive we are among the group. SIFT is Smart Information Flow Technologies. They have algorithms for text mining that look at our journal entries and based on the adjectives and verbs that we're using to tell our emotional states. Dartmouth develops uh, virtual psychological aids for us so that we have a virtual psychologist on our laptops. And University of Maryland designed our spacesuits. Now Cornell, I'll talk about now when we look at these mission patches, Cornell played a huge role in the food. You see the spork here on, on the mission patch from 2013. I actually first applied to high seas for this mission, a four-month mission that was studying Mars food, how to uh, be able to support people's appetite and nutritional requirements without doing the traditional meal ready to eat or MREs that the military has, to have something that's more conventional where you can have separate shelf-stable ingredients and then prepare in a more traditional manner to cook your own meals that fit your tastes. So after uh, that, after they figured out the food, they got this NASA grant for a series of three missions, four, eight, and 12 month. So I was part of the High Seas Three, the eight month mission. And we're the longest uh, to date in the United States for a, a, an analog simulation of space. But High Seas Four, hopefully in, in sometime next summer, will surpass our record and go on and complete their one year mission. So this is where we're located in Hawaii. You can see it's at a high elevation of about 8,200 feet. It's very cold, it's rural and desolate. There's little evidence of any plant life even and animal life around. This is an iron-rich basalt, is a geological term that describes this lava terrain, this lava field. And so we would go out exploring this terrain in our spacesuits. You can see uh, Martha, our commander there, <laughs> just for a scale, and this was when it was, it was near Christmas time and there was snow on, on Mauna Kea, the, the distant, uh, the other volcano there on the big island of Hawaii. So another way that they submerged us in this simulation was by delaying our communications with Earth. So not only did we physically not see anyone, it was also very difficult to talk with our family and friends back home. It took 20 minutes for a message to reach Earth and 20 minutes for it to come back. So at the minimum, we had to wait 40 minutes for a, for a response. And we relied on sustainable energy sources, so primarily solar for all of our energy. And so these are some of the main factors of our simulation, which I've, I've gone through the, most of this list, but let me show you the inside. So you can see the confinement very clearly here. These are small little rooms that were six little pie-shaped rooms in a row. And this is a panoramic of the inside, so you can see those six rooms. And this is the shared space that we used for working out, working, our dining room, and the kitchen is behind that wall, and the laboratory on this side. So it's a total living space of less than 1,000 square feet, a modest 
two bedroom or a larger one bedroom apartment shared with uh, five other people. So it was definitely confined. So they hit the, they were isolated as I showed, we were confined and we were in extreme living conditions. So we had limited water supply. We could only shower for a total of about six minutes per week, six to eight minutes. So we had to do the Navy shower where you turn the water in, on and off and soap up and just be very careful that you don't use all of your shower water in one shower. That would be a, a stress. And so I talked about the shelf stable ingredients and limited privacy. And for internet, um, we had uh, some access to social media, but only to post. Uh, so that we could continue, you know, speaking about the progress of our mission, uh, but we weren't able to have any websites that update in an immediate manner because, again, it's, if you're millions of miles away, it's going to take about 20 minutes was the estimate for, for you to re receive any of this data. So you have to have static web pages like Wikipedia and, and things that aren't updating like CNN.com, for example, wasn't in simulation for us. So here's uh, what our daily activities were like, a photo collage. We worked out a lot because uh, in this confinement we wanted to make sure we stayed healthy and that would be a realistic part of being an astronaut as, as well. You have to work out a lot to keep up your bone and muscle mass but despite only not having full gravity that you oppose every day. You take it for granted but just opposing gravity all the time is keeping up your muscle and bone density. And so this is Tony Horton on our uh, Back to Earth celebration. He's the, the founder of P90X fitness programs, and that was something that we used all the time during our mission, doing these workout videos, and reached out to him sometime during the mission to just explain to him that we feel that he's like our seventh crew member because we spend an hour or two a day with him almost every day. And so he really made our day, our celebration, something extremely special for all of us. A big part was enjoying our meals. There's some homemade ice cream and brownies. So we baked everything from scratch. You had to um, make your own bread. You can't take bread to Mars. It won't last for three years. So you have flour and staples that you make everything yourself. So even in this extremely technical environment, we were learning a lot about old world style cooking. Um, here's the computer game that I mentioned by Johns Hopkins. You can see there's some saliva samples here. So we would measure our stress before and after playing this game. And then you get team and individual scores. So they're analyzing how we, uh, how we uh, compare our individual interests with our team interests. And we also played a lot of board games just for fun. And those were data too. So Sophie and I, you can see, we have the sociometers from Michigan State. And those quantify our, our proximity to one another, as well as the volume of our voice production so they can see and quantify all of our social interactions. Who's hanging out with who the most? Are there any clicks forming? Analyze our social dynamics in that manner. And I guess it was Flannel Friday uh, when we took this photo. Uh, this is, I think why we took the photo was because we both had flannel shirts on. And so the other big task was going out exploring Mauna Loa as if we were the first Mars explorers. So we would uh, get some tasks from mission support go analyze this channel or look at this uh, lava tube. And so this is a measurement device that we uh, use to, with this line going down to measure the depth of, of that uh, pit there. And we would collect samples. This is another huge uh, crater there. And uh, looking out at the lava field, it's Commander uh, Martha there. So this was the most astronaut-like thing we did. The most enjoyable part for me was putting on the suit, feeling that physical and mental challenge of exploring like real uh, Mars explorers will do someday. And it wouldn't be complete without some spacesuit selfies. Uh, <laughs> you could see we, Martha there with the bunny ears. It was Easter. We celebrated a lot of holidays. <laughs> yeah. We celebrated a lot of holidays. And Sophie made those bunny ears and, and decorated our commander there. And yeah, just having some fun. But I could say we weren't always that enthusiastic and happy. So here's some theoretical models about modeling how people's behavior changes over time in isolation and confinement. These theories were developed with crews in Antarctica or underwater in submarines. I'll start first with uh, the green one by Bechtel. It's called the third quarter phenomena. It states that after the halfway point, the novelty or the 
fun and newness of the mission wears off and people have a tough time psychologically, until then they begin to see the light at the end of the tunnel and have an improved uh, psychological state. This one by Rohr, it has three phases. In the beginning, it says there's an elevated alertness in this new environment. Then, uh, oh, excuse me. Then uh, they studied that people have a feeling of depression and regret for even putting themselves in that position to begin with. And then near the end, this volatility, the emotional highs and lows and unpredictability was the third phase of that model. So ideally, we would want to just be smiley the whole time, uh, but it's important for NASA to think about the risks and the worst cases. And so high seas is helping to validate or develop new models for the Mars-specific environment about what are the, the phases that crews go through in, in its environment. So now I'll uh, explain some ways that you can get spacesuit selfies if you want to participate in analogs. Here's a few others. This is the desert research and technology studies that are NASA studies near Flagstaff, Arizona. So they study in situ resource utilization, how to get resources out of the rocks that can be useful to astronauts producing oxygen or water sources. And then uh, one in my home state of Florida, it's the only underwater research laboratory in the world. It's called NEMO. And there you can see uh, Dr. Serena Anand, she's underwater and they're simulating uh, Mars gravity as well. And in this neutral, bu neutrally buoyant um, underwater analog, you can wait the astronauts to change the buoyancy to simulate different levels of gravity. So with Mars, they would simulate what it would be like with the buoyancy to be the equivalent of one-third gravity. And uh, then they can stay for up to three weeks, at least 24 hours in, in Nemo underwater. Um, and crews that simulate what it's like on other planets, asteroids, moon. They can study them all underwater there. This is HERA. It's a newer NASA analog in Texas. And it's smaller than our Mars simulation because ours is like we're already on Mars, whereas this is simulating the journey to Mars. So the participants will enter. They'll feel the sounds and vibrations of takeoff and then have no contact for a week uh, with mission support. So that's that simulation. MDRS is a long, it's a, a long-standing simulation by the Mars Society. These are two-week uh, two uh, simulations throughout the year with different crews. And High Seas is, has just won a grant to study different crew compositions uh, with MDRS missions. So looking at what combination of psychological and professional uh, characteristics will lead to the most high-performing crew. And you can do that more quickly with a two-week mission and higher turnover rate. FMARS is in Canada. It's also by the Mars Society. It's very, very far northern Canada. Our mission director was part of, Ms. of FMARS a number of years ago, and she told us that out on EVAs, they actually have to bring fire al arms along with them in case they have a ferocious bear encounter <laughs> along the way, some alien bears there in northern Canada. Uh, so they also are planning for a full year, 360. 65-day mission, and they had to delay that because they don't have enough funding. The Mars Society is a, a group of citizens interested in space, so if you're feeling generous, uh, you can donate to help them get their full-year mission off the ground. And Mars 500, this is the longest globally. High Seas is the longest duration mission in the United States, but for 520 days, six men stayed in this indoor facility in Moscow as a simulated Mars experiment. And that's actually part of the inspiration for my research. Part of the motivation is that they reported that 85% of their conflicts involved crew members who in their daily surveys said that they had high levels of stress and exhaustion on those days. So it shows that stress and exhaustion can really be more than a, a physical impact on yourself, but it also can impact your relationships around you. So it's important that we can understand stress on a deeper level and uh, that's what I'm working on for my dissertation here at Purdue. And, and, and uh, so first, let's look at some of the stressors. Uh, if we're going to study stress, we have to know what's causing stress. Uh, one that we talked about as a group is just being confined to your social, social situation is a huge stress. You can't get away from the we for the weekend and then come back to your, your dome family. You're constantly together and confined. So here you can see the overhead image of the HAB. This is the second floor with our rooms and the floor plan uh, below. 
And this is a dashboard we use to monitor our resources. So you can see the battery charge, the water levels, the weather outside with our weather station. And here I just pulled a weather report to show that sometimes we would have weeks where we barely saw the sun. Um, what's the problem with that? Well, we rely on solar power, so we needed uh, the sun in order to do all of our, our plans for the week. And we wouldn't have hot water. Uh, we can heat the place. There is a lot of stress that would come just based on the weather. Um, the, also, the food restrictions, both not having fresh food. We had an indoor garden, but uh, the majority of our food were freeze-dried ingredients. And we also would run out of things at times. We never were hungry where we didn't have any food, but we lost some variety along the way. And then the communication delay, I mentioned there's no spontaneity in your conversations with your friends and family back home. It's almost the affect of sending a letter where you don't get a reply for so long, so it feels like a one-way communication in a way. And then the lack of privacy. So just having these uh, lightweight materials to make the dome means there's not a lot of soundproofing. So even when you're alone in your room, you still hear everything else going on in the rest of the habitat, so you can't get away and you feel like you don't have a lot of privacy because there's cameras on the ground floor monitoring everything you do. They're collecting data about us in every single way. And uh, the other is the media actually is a huge stress. Uh, they ask a lot of questions and we're constantly producing content for media. And uh, that was another huge um, impact on our, our, our stress and our privacy. So this is uh, the Martian movie. I, I hope all of you have heard about it. It's coming into theaters soon, or maybe have even read Andy Weir's book. And uh, I think they did a, a great job of explaining the stressors that uh, real astronauts would feel uh, in, in, on a Mar mission to Mars. And the thing is, uh, this guy has a thumbs up, and that's what researchers get a lot of times from the astronauts. Everything's good. We're fine. They have all the incentive in the world to not tell the truth about the stress and exhaustion they're feeling because they want to go out on that next spacewalk. They want to be chosen for the next mission as well. Whereas we don't have that, in, that vested interest and we can be honest with the researchers about the challenges of being in this environment. And the other thing is this is a great opportunity to study some of the real stresses that we face, but not that we can't quantify exactly in our real world. It's full of different restaurants and foods and events and all the communication, the texting, how all of these things impact us is still a, an area of mystery for researchers. How does it all connect over the time course, these acute stresses? How do they accumulate over time and lead to adverse behavioral and health conditions? So in this limited environment of high seas, we're able to study a, many different contexts. We can look at our physiology. For eight months, I was collecting urine and and hair samples to analyze our stress hormones and our uh, health states. And then we're also taking biometrics all the time. So I work with wearable device data. We had wristbands and biometric shirts that were quantifying our, our physiology along the way and our behavior. So we can look at our sleep and activity levels. We are also taking our, emo our emotional states through filling out surveys that would explain how we perceive our stress level to compare with what the data show, but how do you think about it? How do you feel? And then, of course, the environmental, the, the dashboard I showed you is collecting data all the time about our weather and resource states. And in the real world, it just wouldn't be possible to collect all this information about a person. So for eight months, this is a very valuable data source that we can then understand people's health and stress, both to help astronauts and also to look toward uh, developing technologies that are useful to citizens on Earth. The other thing is uh, stress is part of the chronic disease uh, uh, processes that we know uh, occur. So in our, for our ancestors, the fight or flight response would result in elevated glucose uh, to help us to, to flee or fight a predator, maybe a saber-toothed tiger. But that's not as useful when you're feeling stressed at your computer and you're just in this sedentary state. So the elevated glucose can lead to inflammation that is one of the main processes in diseases like heart disease, having chronic inflammation of your blood vessels. So if we can understand stress, we can understand some of the disease development processes that are so prevalent in our society today and an uh, increasing challenge for 
for human beings who are having more and more connection all the day, all day long with these uh, social media and all of our work deadlines, and we just have increasing amounts of stress in, in our culture. And so how can, we, how can we have management that's useful and can help our stress as well as our relationships? So we can look at this at different time scales. Currently on the market, there's lots of wearable devices, well not lots, but there's several wearable devices that can measure uh, real-time stress by looking at the galvanic skin response or like the sweaty palms you get when you're nervous. Uh, and then heart rate variability, the variability in your, in your heart rate over time is also an indicator of stress. But there's not a lot that can look at more short-term, medium-term uh, measures of your stress to help you understand how your behavior is putting you in maybe some of these, these feedback loops where your behavior is getting into this negative feedback where you need to intervene and have some way to get you off, off that stressful, unhealthy state and back into uh, a more uh, productive system. That, so that's why we're analyzing this as a system, so as a human integrated system, to look at the physiological, emotional, environmental, behavioral, all of these contexts context over the long duration of eight months. We have data from uh, different time scales and contexts. So this is uh, the recap of, uh, of my talk. We have, uh, we want to get Earth independence, and that's a dawn because we currently are out, our, our resource, our pace of use of resources is outpacing what we can support on Earth. So Peter Diamatis writes about the time of abundance that the, the space program will bring to us, a time where we'll be harvesting resources from space and we'll, we'll, he's saying get ready for a time of abundance, no more doom and gloom. The space program is going to solve a lot of, of the issues we have. Uh, team performance, the study of, of the relationships that we have on a crew to uh, over time for three years to stay cooperative. Uh, in our culture we have increasing divorce rates, we have uh, financial hardship and emotional hardship as a result. So if we can understand how to better support our relationships on a Mars crew, we can also use some of these uh, conflict management and debriefing methods at home as well. And then health and stress. So studying uh, the aging and disease processes to develop technologies and, and biomedical methods that will help us uh, both keep astronauts safe and, and again on Earth. So um, with that, I'm glad to take your questions. And, and thank you again for attending my talk. And you can, you, if you want, you can come to the front and use this mic, or I'll bring it around. Anyone? Yep, thank you. Okay. I don't know if it's. Mm -hmm. Maybe just a little closer. Y yeah. Well, okay. I, I think it's working now. Yeah. Yep. And so that, uh, a lot of questions about the food. Before you went in, were there um, special attempts made to um, balance the diet in certain nutritional ways, certain amount of protein, carbohydrate, et cetera? Uh, so they didn't tell us what we had to eat every day, but with that first food study, they, they showed that with the ingredients they gave us, we could have nutritionally um, all the things that we would need and not have deficiencies develop over time. But they didn't regulate our meals like they did in the first food study. And they provide us any supplements we need as right. well. Were there certain sources of protein that you had, for example? Yeah, so for protein, we had uh, freeze-dried meats and tofu. So the freeze-dried meats are like um, diced chicken, ground beef, uh, pork, diced ham. And they're just like crumbles in a way. And then you add water, and it becomes some, like, like normal chicken. Yeah, and, and did anybody ever try to, to do totally vegetarian? Uh, none of us did vegetarian, uh, but we had gluten-free on the crew as a dietary well, restriction. Well, so but trendy, yeah. <laughs> even on Mars, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it was, you know, actually uh, has to have uh, intolerance. Know, just but yeah, yeah, it just, is. Just trendy. one final question. I'll turn mm -hmm. it over. Um, when you were out, um, uh, you know, doing the exploring, were efforts made to like mine certain things, like you would try to use in situ resources? Yes, um, we especially looked at building structures, uh, which type of lava would be useful for building a, a shelter uh, that we would need to, in, in the event of a solar storm or a radiation storm, where we could build shelters underground or uh, with these materials build other habitats. 
Uh, we didn't actually have like moxie like to extract oxygen from the rocks, but we would measure the composition, the mineral characteristics, and, and characterize it in that way. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I understand high seas has a pretty high focus on the human factors and behavioral studies. Um, Sometime in the next 20 years, when that well has run dry, do you expect high seas to be able to pivot to the more technology and exploration tactics focus, more in the way that MDRS and FMARS does? Um, so in the pit that runs dry, uh, can you expect, do you mean like when we have humans figured out and we don't need to worry about the relationships? Well, or? presumably, <laughs> presumably, there's not t it, presumably there's not 20 years more worth of exclusively human factors research necessary before we can start sending humans on this path. Event, I understand why we need to focus on it now since we haven't developed the technology to test yet. Uh -huh. um, but it does seem like eventually we need to pivot towards focusing on exploration tactics and the technologies we're actually going to bring with us to right. Mars and developing the strategies to use them. Um, again, in the same way yeah. that MDRS and FMARS have been focusing on for the last 15 years. Do you expect high seas to play a bigger role in that once it has more thoroughly explored the parameter space of human behavioral studies? Yeah, I think they're going to increasingly look at EVA, uh, spacewalk kind of uh, technology, communication protocols, how do you coordinate the human factors of exploration as well. Uh, but there's a lot going on in Hawaii in the same area that they are looking at how to use the resources, studying this uh, analog for the terrain and studying the uh, technological kind of uh, research and technology studies going on in the area. But the main, like, why high seas was developed was to study the human cog cognitive and behavioral aspects. So in the future, I mean, it's there so people can write grants to use it. Um, there's a lot of HERO uh, grant applications that require space analogs, so you can propose studies that would use this analog in, in useful ways. Uh, but for now, the NASA grants support, as you said, like the health and behavioral. Uh, but there is a lot of uh, technology studies that are just focusing on how, to, how do we use the resources and how do we characterize the geology of, of the area. You talked about having saliva tests and hair tests and all these devices. Yes. Now, my question is, was there a starting point that you did before you got into the facility? Did you start before to kind of have a, a starting point? Yeah, and then was there a continuation after you got out and went home to see, you know, how it had gone back to, if you want to say, the normal levels? Right. Uh, so we... We only knew that we were selected for, are you gonna back? Okay, yeah. Um, so we only knew about the selection about two months before we entered the habitat. And a lot of studies of astronauts at, um, at the ISS, they've shown that the first data point is almost like an outlier because there's so much stress in preparing for the mission. So uh, th we do have data from the very beginning, but uh, we don't, look at that in the same way as the health and stress throughout the mission that's more due to the mission itself um, as far as instead of the preparation uh, that you have in the beginning. And we have a lot of surveys that we're continuing uh, now for the next year so we have to answer some surveys intermittently about uh, how we feel about our group today versus when we were in the habitat. Are we still talking? Uh, those kinds of things uh, they're studying but not biological sampling anymore. I had two quick questions. I, I was curious what kinds of conflicts emerged within the team. And then is that a window? I'm just wondering if you had a view yeah. out. Yes. Um, so there were conflicts that arise. Uh, one thing that we have to be careful about when we talk about our conflicts is that we are, uh, by the, we are under the rules of the Institutional Review Board, so they have to protect our privacy and identity. So when I, I can't like give you any kind of uh, gossip kind of things about the conflict, but um, it's such a long period of time and that's why they're studying it because they know that conflict will inevitably uh, come up in the group for such a long period of time. So one way that we dealt with it a lot was through working out together. Uh, sometimes if someone was frustrating you or uh, you were just having your own personal kind of stress going on with things in the outside world, when you work out, by the end of the workout, you almost just forget what was bothering you. 
a couple hours earlier. So that was one day way we really dealt with our stress. And yeah, looking out the window, uh, there's this one uh, had our garden in front uh, of it, so we really couldn't see it. But there was another window on the other side looking out at Mauna Kea. And when I was stressed, often uh, we had our treadmill set up right in front of there, and I would pretend like I was running away, even though I wasn't going anywhere at all. <laughs> so yeah, those questions go together beautifully. Um, what would you say was your biggest stress? Hmm. I think my biggest stress was actually um, the social kind of entertainment. Um, I thought, you know, I'm being isolated from the rest of the world, right? So I'm going to read all of these books. I'm going to just be completely work focused. And it turns out that you're isolated from the rest of the world, but you're confined to your own social situation. So you still have the same peer pressure of, let's go watch a movie, you know, let's play games. Let's Let's, so there is still all those distractions, but even more intense because they're right there with you. You can't get away. So I think that was my biggest stress. Uh, I guess I'm more introverted than I realize. <laughs> I need my space. Well, you just mentioned books. Did, did you and everybody bring like lots of books and swap them throughout the course of the, the time frame? Yeah, uh, we had like a digital library of tons of books. Uh, so we would share, I mean, I have terabytes of stuff that I didn't have before, books and movies, and we would share all those files to, to keep us entertained. I, I brought eight books, like physical books, along with me, and I only read two of them. <laughs> so um, not as much reading time as expected. I had two questions mm -hmm. uh, besides that. Um, were ear, you said you could hear everything at night, snoring, whatever. Were earplugs pretty common? Yeah, especially, like, I would use earplugs even during the day sometimes um, because there was a lot of cooking that we had to do during the afternoons because that was when the sun was out and producing the most energy. And so there could be loud pots and pans and all the things going on. So I would often do earplugs and then headphones with music <laughs> so that I could completely, like, uh, you know, noise canceling, but um, extreme noise canceling. <laughs> and then my last question was more scientific. Um, you mentioned in your talk about how weather affected you quite a bit. Um, mm -hmm. And I was assuming you're talking about Earth weather yes. there with not being able to have sunlight for your solar. Mm -hmm. uh, from what we know of Mars, how does that compare? Would you face the same kinds of things, um, weather patterns up there? Yeah, um, and how so would that affect the solar part. Yeah, the the main weather threat that they have are dust storms, uh, which can definitely have an impact on the amount of sun sunlight that's getting to the solar pan, solar arrays to produce their power, and they have even less sunlight uh, than we have. They're a bit further away from the sun, so I could see that weather being an uh, extreme factor on on them as well. Um, they also have radiation storms to worry about that we didn't have to. We simulated one uh, where we, we, went, we went through our emergency protocols and took cover in a nearby, uh, it's called a lava tube. It's basically like an underground uh, cave where the lava once, once flowed through. And um, so we took cover under there to shelter us, us from the radiation storm. So that would be another type of weather that we just simulated, but real astronauts will face this true hazard of. Here. Uh, this is going to sound like I'm joking, but I'm actually not. Okay. It seems like it would make a great reality show mm -hmm. uh, and perhaps very educational and, and build public support. Did you guys ever discuss that? Right. Um, our mission director has had lots of producers come to her and say, hey, can we make a reality show out of your your uh, simulation. But the thing is, like I mentioned, the in Institutional Review Board, so as a research project that's not allowed, you have to protect the identity and confidentiality of the participants. So uh, as a research project, it's not possible. But the Mars One uh, project is uh, intended to, by the Dutch entrepreneurs, is intended to be funding a, a one-way mission to Mars based on a reality show, the money that they can get from it. So as long as it's not a research project, you, you could do something like that. I think it would be a pretty boring show, to be honest. <laughs> but I don't know, that's just my opinion. <laughs> Mary? Yeah? Uh, what would radiation storms do to your equipment? Right. Yeah, you have to have electronics that are rad hard, is what they call it. Um, so basically, you could have 
for some things it might not be worth it to go through that to it's very expensive and it takes a lot of resource to make all of your equipment rad hard so you could just have a lot of replacements as well as another way to deal with it uh, but a lot of people make comments about how the electronics on, on the space station or the shuttle were like so old but the reason why is, is because they had to make them rad hard and, and go through that process so um, a lot of like when I talked about the wearable devices with some of the NASA researchers are like well they're so lightweight and everything we'd probably just send them you know multiple and then they can have it in a protected area and just have redundancy as a, another way Okay, uh, so Zach, for his research, I did health and stress states, he did 3D printing. So the idea there is that uh, you, you want to be able to make parts on the fly. If you're on your way to Mars and something breaks, you can't wait eight months uh, for the resupply to, to make it there, or it might just be infeasible for them to send what you need. So they can send instead the plan of the part you make, and of you need, and then you can make it there yourself. So we had a made in space uh, 3D printer there in the habitat, and we were able to make things to fix our dishwasher one time, fix watch bands, you know, we did uh, different uh, uh, immediate repairs and also made some fun things like models of our habitat to send to, to K through 12 students and uh, made toys and game parts. Uh, so it was, it was great to have that. Thank you for asking. <laughs> Do you have an, oh, same question? <laughs> Great. Yeah. So. so that's where you went from the reality of the Yes. I, um, I went into the simulation unsure. I thought, three years, wow, you know, that's such a sacrifice. But the months really flew by, and it kind of made time seem more relative to me. When you're doing something that you feel is valuable and meaningful, time just flies by. And um, going out in the spacesuit and feeling what it would be like to explore Mars made me realize, like, hey, I'm ready. <laughs> Let's do it. I, I want to definitely apply for the next astronaut selection and see where it goes. And then with commercial space, a lot of opportunities are emerging as well. So that's, that's a positive. Kind of a follow-up question. Are you interested in going and coming back, or are you interested in yes. going <laughs> Yes. Yes. Um, I'm interested in going and coming back at this stage of my life. I'm not ready to say goodbye to Earth, but um, if I were maybe older, there's uh, some people that say you should send an aged crew, actually, uh, because it wouldn't be such a detriment on your quality of life later. Uh, so if you do develop, say, cancer, and you're a 40-year-old astronaut, that's taking a lot off your lifespan, whereas if you sent an older uh, crew, then it wouldn't take so much off their, their life. All right, seems like we wrapped it up. Thank you.